Father, we thank you tonight. Father, we give you all the glory. Father, we honor you. Thank you for this opportunity. We are here because you called us. And you never call except you have a purpose for your call. And so, Father, we are here to answer your call. And we are asking you to show up, Daddy. Show up, Daddy. Daddy, show up tonight. Let your name be glorified. Thank you, precious Father. We worship and adore you. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Tonight, we are trusting God to help us to be what he called us to be. Tonight, we want to go to the source and the intention of the team for this year's convention. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flattery. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. I want to thank God for our father and our mother in the Lord for listening to God and hearing from him for whatever he has for us this year. And I want to thank God for all those who God has used in bringing you the word and, and laying the foundation for today's message. So I'm building on the foundation that God has used the great men of God before me to lay. The quotation I've just given you is from Prophet Daniel's description of the person, character, and intentions of the man of sin, which is Satan's own representative in human flesh, who is expected to execute the devil's plan for the last few years of this world as we now know it. The scripture, both the Old and the New Testament, makes it clear that we are in the last days. Actually, we are in the last days of the last days because the last day, according to Peter, resumed at Pentecost. So, we can expect the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning this period in this our time and now. What I'm saying is this. When God spoke to Prophet Daniel, and the angel that came to give him the interpretation of the message and to give him the revelations in Daniel chapters 10 and 11 and 12, after they gave him the message, he was perturbed, he was surprised. He just didn't understand and he was told, don't worry, don't try to understand it. Because what you are being told is not for your time. It's for a time ahead. By that time, knowledge will have increased and they will be able to interpret some of the things that are written down. Just write it, seal it, and go your way. Amen. Yes. Knowledge 
has always been increasing ever since. And uh, we happen to be the generation that we witness what God has given to Daniel. The prophecies of Daniel in chapters 10, 11, and 12 are corroborated in Revelations in chapters 12, 13, chapter 7, chapter 11, because the word of God is a continuum from the beginning to the end is just one word. God just revealed them from time to time as he wants. Just why the Bible says it's a little precept here, a little there, and you get the message. So we are seated here tonight as people who represent God's kingdom in these last days. And uh, from the song that the choir has been gracious to sing, I am a soldier. And I'm waiting for the voice of my commander. And if he calls me even once, I will answer a million times. That is talking of readiness. The message God is leading me to bring tonight it's not very much popular, but I have not been called to be popular. I have been called to be faithful and obedient, and that's what I'm going to do. Tonight, the prophecies that I have referred to and some of which you will discover if you read those, I mean, the Revelations and the Daniel, they are mostly of gloom and doom for the world and for the church. This is a time that the church should be up and vigilant. Because it is meant to be triumphant. Unfortunately, it is not exactly what that is. Praise be to God that the creator of the universe has not and will not lose control of his world. And therefore, God has his own plan for this time of gloom and doom. If you think things are bad in the world, no, it's not bad. It's just beginning to shape into real badness. Yep. 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 And I, I know that will not sound good in the air of people, especially in Nigeria, but you are looking at the economy. And the economy is just one of many, many things that make the world the world. And be informed as you are in pain economically here in Nigeria. So are people all over the world. And that is because it is primarily arranged that way. Not by God, but by, by the enemy that we are up against. Amen? As God's adopted children who are saved by grace and called to be co-liberals with Jesus Christ in saving the ready and willing as well as prepare his own family for the final battle for the control of this world before we are taking home we shall, in the time, more time that I have, we do the best that we can to examine what the scripture says about this battle and our expected preparations, our weapons and our strategies to ensure that we do great exploits for 
our kingdom. Amen. The message I'm trying to cram into 30 something minutes is meant to be for four straight days of hours. So I am trusting the Holy Spirit to fulfill his purpose. Amen. Now, to do justice to this, I want to try and approach this. I want to look at this battle from this perspective. I want to suspect that you are beginning to see that I'm talking of war, right? You don't, you don't feel it yet? Ah. Where did, what did the choir sing? Huh? There are soldiers. I am a soldier. You are a soldier. Ah. The sad part is that most of us are soldiers sleeping in the barrack. While the army is creeping up, the army of the other side is creeping up on us. Hello? There is a document that has just been declassified not too long ago. It's one of the secret diaries of Winston Churchill, who was the Prime Minister of Britain during the Second World War. And what was in one of those secret files was how he arranged how to sink the most dangerous Japanese ship that was carrying terrible, serious weapons that if it had reached Britain, if it had reached any part of the then United West against, I mean, they have just taken care of, uh, uh, what's his name now? The guy in Germany. Huh? Hitler. Adolf Hitler has just been taken care of. He's been put down, but Japan was getting up and Japan also wants to do world domination. And this church he saw, and he arranged something. And it was that singular, super confidential assignment that broke the back of Japan. It's now a movie, it's a documentary. And what he arranged was, when... Japanese were there, the Japanese Navy were there. It was arranged that there was going to be a party. They arranged a party, they arranged women for them, they arranged singing for them, everything was fine, and they had this wonderful day where they declared the vacation. Everybody, you soldiers, you have a free day. Go ahead and enjoy yourself. Not knowing it was all arranged from the enemy's camp. And that very night, while they were enjoying and having a wonderful day, they were caught unawares, unready. And the result is that the one battleship that could have destroyed and start something terrible was sunk. It was finished. It was assumed it was not possible. But it was done. It was done because it took Churchill and a few of his generals secret planning and they saw that the, only, the way to do it is make these people believe everything is fine, give them a party night, and that night strike. And that's exactly what the devil has been doing with the church. Devil has lured us into sleeping. He has given us the impression that there is no problem. And if there is any problem at all, it's nothing so serious. Children of God, let's quickly see how much we can go. Number one, 
the reason and goal and purpose of the conflict or the battle. Number two, the warring parties in this battle. Number three, the person and character of the captain of our own army. Number four, our fire power. Number five, the Lord's army, its personnel and training. And six, the current and coming foes that are coming against us. Amen. By the grace of God, when we finish tonight, God, I believe, will give me grace to pray with you concerning your present needs and challenges. We all have challenges. But tonight, our focus is not on our problems. I mean, your individual problems and a lot of... Uh... So, what we have on our hands is much more than you don't have money. It's far more than you, don't, you are not promoted. It's far more than visa. It's far more than your idea of uh, a good life. I wanted to show you a seven-minute video. Unfortunately, I've not been able to get it downloaded. I requested for it from my nephew, who is a major in the U.S. Army. And he went through the rank, I mean, the authority, and gave it to me. It is the training of the U.S. Special Forces. How they are trained. It is not an easy thing at all. It's serious discipline. It requires a lot of sacrifices. And as a matter of fact, only a little percent of those who start the training ever accomplish it, ever finish. And when the training is going on, you are free to opt out. Because they are very small, very, the Navy, the Navy SEAL, American Navy SEAL, very small in number. But they are used to do serious things all over the world. Eliminate and take up heads of states, take up America's enemy, take up all kinds of things. And they will come and reach you before you know it and it doesn't matter what, how serious your so-called security is. So how are these people trained? So I requested and I had it. Unfortunately, I can't put it on. Amen. Now, let's quickly see what we can do. The reason, goal, and purpose of the conflict. From the beginning, which we have no record of. Lucifer, who later became Satan and the devil, was a favorite and highly placed, powerful, and respected servant of God. He served as an angel, and he attained the rank of archangel before he fell. Hear what he was, how he was described in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15. Now, let me remind you that the genealogy, I mean, theologically, no one knows for sure the time distance between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. In Genesis 1-1, the Lord created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis 1-2, the word of God says, and the earth became void. We don't know what happened I mean, or whatever, how long it was between Genesis 1-1 when it was created and when it became void and disrupted. So, the weakening of the nations is what resulted in Genesis 1-2. Do you understand what I'm saying? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis 1, 2, between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, a lot of things happened. One of them is what is described as the weakening of the nations, which 
we are referred to here in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, verses 12 to 15. He says, Here, how have you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground. You are you who weakened the nations. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the further sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high God. And God said, no, you will not. God's answer was, according to Ezekiel chapter 8, I mean chapter 28, he said, you shall be brought down to shore, to the lowest depths of the pit. Lucifer rebelled against God, and God pronounced judgment on him. Unfortunately, he did not fall alone. He had a third of God's angels to partake in the rebellion, and they fell with him. That's according to Revelation chapter 12, verses 3 to 4. Thereby, constituting himself and his fellow rebels into an anti-God army. So God expelled them from his presence. And they have since taken abode in other spheres and realms, somewhere between the earth and God's heaven. Amen? Right now, because the devil can't stand before God, he was expelled. Of course, he still visits God, but he has his abode now in somewhere between God's own heaven and earth. That's where, what is called in, uh, in the Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. That's where they live. That's where they have their office. That's where they have their abode. That's where they operate from. So they are neither here nor there. Amen. There is a final battle that is coming and for which God needs you now. And that is the issue of the great exploit. That final battle, when it is going to be fought, this is going to be in the, that is the Revelation chapter 12 battle. In that Revelation chapter 12 battle, the devil will now be sent away, even from that place where he is, and he will be sent here. It will be here. And the Bible says when that happens, woe to the earth. Because the time for his judgment is now very close. And he will do the worst damage during that time. But between that time and now, what he's doing right now is that is waging the war he can against that which God used to replace him. Hello? How, has any of you seen a woman who is maltreated or who thought she was something and she, okay, let's go to the Bible. Do you think Vashti liked Esther? Hello? You know who Vashti is? Who was Vashti? The wife of uh, King uh, Ahasuerus. 
which in history is Xerxes I. Now, she messed up. She misused opportunity. She misused grace. And she was sent away. And Esther was brought in. Do you think Vashti liked Esther? Why? Huh? Okay. What makes you think that the devil likes you? He missed up, he missed his position, he's thrown out, and God said, now let's make man in our own image. And let them take care of the earth we have created, which this guy messed up. And now you are replacing the devil in everything. And you think the devil likes you? No, he doesn't. It doesn't at all. There are only two ways to deal with the devil. You either compromise, bow to him, and let him rule you, and he gives you whatever he likes for the expense of your soul, or you fight him. God raised the church to fight the devil. The ministry we are given is called the, the, the ministry of destruction. We have the ministry of destruction committed to us. The Bible says Jesus Christ came to do what? To destroy the works of the devil. And when he was going, John 20, 21, he said, As my father has sent me, so am I sending you. So, you continue with the ministry of destruction. But you know what? The devil doesn't always come in fierceness. If you are expecting the devil to come in that Imaginary ma, black person with horn uh, that shows and, and they tell you that is the devil. It's a lie. The devil is that beautiful lady in your office who wants you to sleep with her. The devil is that person who is telling you he can promote you if you do his will. The devil, his greatest arsenal, his greatest power is in deception. He comes like an angel of light, even when he is thick darkness. Amen. So, the warning parties are God on one side with his mighty angels and with you and I. Whereas on the other side is the devil and his fallen angels and all that he could recruit. This has been on for a long time. It will only come to a final end in this generation that we are. Amen? Paul says we are to be Ready for all the wiles, that is the schemes, the deceptions of the devil. Amen? Jesus Christ is the captain of our own army. And the Bible says that we should look unto him, the author and finisher of our faith. I am jumping. I can see the clock clicking. Children of God. The devil is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. Hmm? But he's very good at suspicion. 
is very, very suspicious. The devil could look at you as a young man and see your fire and the, the, the fire of God in you and say, this one is going to end up as a minister of God. If we let him alone like this, he's a danger to our program. So what do we do? Before you even know you are ending up in ministry, he has arranged a wife that will make sure that he's an inner man for you. He ensures that he recognizes your weakness. If it is money, lust for power, popularity, desire to be known, he will walk it into the scheme that he has for you. That's why Colossians 3.5 says, this, he says, kill, mortify, kill your members which are on the earth. And when he mentioned those members, he didn't mention your eye and which is the members of your body. But he's mentioning fornication and adultery, concupiscence. Why? Because you are born with those things just like you are born with your head and your eye. Do you understand? So when the word of God says, kill them, if you don't kill them, they will kill you. They will kill your ministry. They will kill your marriage. They will kill your destiny. Why? Because those are the instruments that the devil uses. And it's available for everybody. You don't even have to learn it. You are just born with it. Hello? I know I'm talking to very honest people here. How many, how many people have ever lied here? Have you ever lied? No, I, no, I can't see any hand. So you are all, you have never lied, eh? Holy people. <laughs> okay, let, let me assume you lie. The next question is, when did you learn to lie? When? You just discovered that you can lie. The first day you catch your boy, took something that you didn't give him, and you say, who took it? You, you put it right behind him, and say, I didn't take it, I didn't take it. That is us. The devil knows our weaknesses, and that's what he uses against us. Amen. Now, don't forget that we are called into the ministry of demolition and destruction of the devil's work. But how did Jesus succeed? He succeeded by, number one, he knew what he was called to do, and he kept his focus on his purpose and his call. Because the word of God says, looking unto him. Amen? Two, Jesus was willing to pay the price, whatever it was that was necessary to fulfill purpose. Jesus was ready to pay the price. The Bible says, in Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he was God, he did not think it robbery to be equal with God. What does that mean? He didn't grab it. He didn't stay there. He let go of it. And he came. And when he came, he suffered. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 5 says, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. 
So he knew why he was called and he was ready to pay the price for what he was called. Amen. And if you think you are, you are facing temptation, go and look at the temptation of Jesus. After he was baptized, Matthew 3, where God himself pronounced him, this is my beloved son. He went into the wilderness. And after 40 days and nights of fasting, the devil came to him and offered him, he wants him to achieve legitimacy in an illegitimate way. It's only legitimate that when you are hungry, I mean, after fasting 40 days, you should be hungry. But how do you meet that hunger? How do you meet that need? He gave that to him. He asked him to go onto the mountain and showed him the whole world. And he said, jump down. When you jump down, according to Psalm 91, God has said he will send his angels. They will carry you. Can you imagine what will happen tomorrow in the newspaper headlines? Jump from uh, Mount Kilimanjaro and he didn't die. You will be an instant celebrity. And Jesus said, no, I won't do that. He said, okay. Now, why do you and I have to be fighting? Why do we have to meet on the cross, why go to the cross when you can have the whole world by just bowing to me? In one form or the other, you also will go through all these things. So you will. But Jesus prefers to go to the cross. And there he fought him. And there the Bible says he made a public show of him. He disarmed him. And when he came, in that Matthew, but chapter 28, the Bible says in verse 18, and Jesus came and said, Now every power and authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. See what it cost him. But he got it. Amen. Now, this power and authority, the Bible now says in Ephesians chapter 1, and then down to from the last three, four, five verses, he says, he has given him this power when he raised him from the dead, high above all powers and unto the church. So everything that Jesus got on the cross was for the church. Because he was going to multiply himself in the church, and the church can now take care of what he came to do. Amen. <clears throat> but the devil knows and says, okay, let's go for the church. Let's deal with the church. And he came with his weapon, the weapon of deception. Children of God, we have what it takes to be all that God called us to be. But we are not what God called us to be now. And this is why we have to now seek to know our God so that we can do great exploits. Why? Because these last days we call for people who are strong and who know their God. Amen. Amen. Children of God, like I told you, there's very little we can do. But
let's look at the state what we are in right now what is our situation right now what is our situation the devil is not a guy that uh, we just do things on the spot the moment he plans very well Even Jesus said, children of the devil are wise in their own ways. They are smart. He's very good at planning. And the result is, many years before we knew what was happening, he has had a plan that, could, that is as perfect as it could be. To deal with the church. Let me tell you. My greatest. Confidence. In the future of the church. Is the promise of Jesus. That the gate of hell. Shall not prevail. Because that is the decree. Of the owner of the church. The gate of hell. Shall not prevail. But. The gate of fear shall fight the church. He will do battle against the church by all the means that he knows. And that's exactly what he's doing right now. The first thing that the devil saw that he could do very well is to change the gospel that has been committed to our hand. The, 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 the gospel that we were given is not just happening. Paul said, I told you with tears that some people are coming in and they are bringing a gospel that is not a gospel at all. He said, let such people be accursed. Peter talked of the same thing. John talked about the same thing. John talked about the spirit of the Antichrist. So this thing has been from the beginning. Amen. Let's look at, let's see how much we can. Let's look at John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Verses 37 to 39. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Yes. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of the living water. But this is speak of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Amen. That is the gospel. He says... If anyone believes on me, as the scripture has said. That's verse 38. Go back one verse. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said. That is to say there is a scriptural believing. There is an unscriptural believing. I might not be able to do much, but please listen to where I am now. One of the devices of the enemy that made us lose power, the power, all the power from in heaven and on earth that God gave to the church, what made us to lose it is that we were introduced to a, a belief 
that is not scriptural. They believe that is scriptural. The Bible says the result is that it will make you to be the source. It will be you will you become God's conduit pipe through which he will flow out to others. God's power is there. He wants to flow out into the world. God works through humans as his agents. And so, God wants to flow through you to reach the world. So, what, what does that make that Christianity? Christianity is a given a responsibility. It's a situation where you become through whom God can reach out with deliverance, with salvation, with all that it takes. Is that what the church is today? Come on, is that what you are preached to? No. Come to Jesus. And you will have money. And you will overcome your enemy. And your life will never be the same. Not because you know what Jesus is. No. But because, I don't know. And so the result is that we have our churches packed full of beggars. Who came looking for the goodie that we promised, but which Jesus never promised? What Jesus promised is Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. Come unto me, you who labor, that is, who are trying to please God by your own effort, and who have heavy yoke. I mean, heavy load laid on you, either by the system, by generation of wickedness or whatever. And I will give you rest. But that was not the end of it. In verse 29, he now says, take my yoke upon you. Now, he didn't say bring your neck and I will put my yoke on you. No. Take my yoke upon you. And learn of me. For I am meek and lowly. And the result is that you will now find rest for yourself. You will find rest for your soul. Amen? Amen. Now tonight, let me tell you the truth. You are free to come to Jesus. And take the first rest and go. And that's what many people prefer. They prefer to have that yoke taken. The yoke that links them with the devil. The yoke that links them with the powers that control their life. And the heavy burden on them. Burden of sickness, of barrenness, of failure or whatever. And as soon as God takes that away... They are ready to pay him for it. So they pay Jesus their offering. They pay him their tithe. They pay him their seed. But this idea of you bringing your neck and now beginning to be a yoke partner with Jesus, nobody wants that. Unfortunately, when you don't put that yoke on you and let him be a co-partner with you, you can never fulfill the purpose for which he died on the cross. You can never be empowered to do anything. Amen. Now, there are a few things that you have to have but because of our time. Uh, let me see. Let me talk briefly about where we have to end tonight. And that is the you of the Holy Spirit. Amen? 
Let me show you this five ministries of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead. As no word, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. But it's a perfect concept. It's the best we could come up with in describing the triune God. The God that is one, but who manifests in the different ways we have come to know him. One is the ministry of conviction. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. According to John chapter 16 verse 8. So that ministry and service of the Holy Spirit in us and for us starts long before we even know him. It is the Holy Spirit that brought you to Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit that made you to even respond to the advertisement for this convention. It is the Holy Spirit that makes you to read the tract. Many, many people have read the tract and they have thrown it away. They've torn it. Some have even used it to ramp hemp. But when the ministry of conviction comes through the Holy Spirit, it convicts you. Convicts you of sin, convicts you of righteousness, convicts you of judgment of God, convicts you of the judgment that is coming, convicts you of the fact that your life can be better. And that God has a purpose. Amen. The second ministry of the Holy Spirit is sonship. When we accept and confess Jesus Christ as our Savior, our spirit is born into the family of God. And he gives us his Holy Spirit, that is the gene that makes him God. He gives us that spirit and makes us children of God. So we acquire sonship. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that gene or seed of God in us does not sin. And when we yield to him, we too are enabled to live sin free. If we choose to. Amen. The third ministry of the Holy Spirit is the ministry of sealing for identification and preservation. For sonship, you can write John chapter 1 verse 12 and chapter 3 verses 5 to 6 of John. John 1, 12, John 3, 5 to 6. Now for the ministry of identification and preservation, it's Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. And Romans chapter 8 from verse 9 to 14. Romans chapter 8 from verse 9 to 14. The Holy Spirit secures us and our salvation. He keeps us holy and keeps us from the evil one. That is Satan and his agents. First John chapter 1 I mean, chapter 5, verse 18 says, the one that is born of God keeps himself pure, and that evil one does not touch him. Amen? Now, with these three ministries of the Holy Spirit, every child of God is guaranteed to make heaven. Because Jesus, who purchased our eternal life, we we'll see to it that he finishes well what he has started as long as we remain in him. Amen? Did you hear me? So the ministry of conviction, of sonship, of sealing and preservation take you to heaven. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. I said Philippians 1, 6. 
Hebrews 7.25 and Hebrews 10.14. But to live victorious, purposeful, and fruitful Christian lives, we must take advantage of two more ministries of the Holy Spirit. Hello? Number one, which is number four ministry of the Holy Spirit is infilling and abiding presence. Infilling and abiding presence. John 14, verse 17. John 20, verses 22 to 23. And Ephesians chapter 5. From verse 18 to 21. Ephesians 5, 18 to 21. This ministry of the Holy Spirit is what enables the believer to live a life that is above the average, above the mediocre life of Christianity and brings us to a level at which we can truly hunger and desire to be enlisted in God's army. It quickens our human spirit to be aware of the fact that we matter to God and his kingdom beyond what we can get from him. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit that makes us aware that true Christianity is giving of ourselves, not just getting from God. According to that, John chapter 17, verse 37, from verse 37 to 39, that I have just quoted. Finally, is the ministry of empowering. The ministry of empowering is reserved for service and is released according to the nature and the size of the believer's assignment. It is what is called the anointing. And this comes after the initial baptism of the Holy Spirit, which comes with the infilling. Amen. So you cannot receive that anointing which Jesus Christ said you shall receive after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So you have the infilling, which is the fourth ministry of the Holy Spirit, then you have this fifth one, which is reserved only for those in the assignment that God has called them to do. Amen? So, it is meant for specific assignments. Even in the Old Testament, even though it didn't dwell in them, it came as they needed it, achieved what he was assigned to do, and he will live. Amen. Children of God. I am sure tomorrow morning we'll be here, but the, the, what God is asking me to talk about tomorrow morning, it's not about this. It's another aspect of it. Right now, the Antichrist is already here. It's just a matter of knowing who he is. How do I know that? I know that because everything that is needed for him to show up is already there. Amen. We are talking of a global issue. Global Christianity. When, when the devil said he wanted to climb to the mountain, you want to rule the mountains. You know the mountains, some have identified, they say there are seven, maybe. There's the mountain of religion, there's the mountain of education, the mountain of uh, entertainment, the mountain of uh, politics, the mountain of so many, four, seven of them. He wants to rule them. And we are called to make sure it doesn't happen.
He said he wants to, that's what he wants. That's his own purpose. It's world control. World control. So the devil is using everything available to him. Science, politics, everything. Amen? He didn't create anything, but he uses everything God has created to work against God. And those who are working for him are working extra hard. They are working extra hard. The world organizations, the organizations of the world, are all being controlled by just a small handful of people. The World Health Organization, which is headed by somebody who knows nothing about medicine. The World Bank, owned by the Rothschild family. So many things. When you heard about COVID-19, those who didn't know, know by now, it was arranged. And the latest is now being arranged. Another one is coming. Because their goal is to reduce the world population, if possible, to less than a million. I mean a billion, rather. That's the way he wants it. Economically, he has to make, make sure everybody is so impoverished that by the time he comes, he asks you to take his mark, you won't argue because you want to survive. But we have been so deceived, the devil has deceived us so much that the whole church, the whole church, well, let me not say the whole church, almost and I don't mean welcome. No. The whole universal church believes that what we are waiting for now is the rapture. The rapture. The rapture. Go and sit down. Rapture call. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says the Antichrist is coming and he will be giving time to punish you for standing with God. For daring to refuse everything that he's giving you. So, but how did we come to how, how, did, how did that come to happen? By deception. In 1830, there was a woman in the city of Avon in England. Her name was Margaret. And she said, Don't say the Lord. There will not be any tribulation until I have raptured my church. Which went against every teaching from the beginning of the church until that time. Unfortunately, Dabi, who has the Bible Bible, the Dabi Bible, the Bible Dabi translation, from whom others like uh, Scofield and the others learned, was a member. And so through Dabi, that system and that teaching went all over the world. The same 1830 was when Mormonism started. The well, same 1830 was when the Jehovah Witnesses started. So it was a period of deception. And before the church knew it, it became part of it. See how much damage it has been done. And so, if I know that right as I'm talking now, some will say, they should want this man. He cannot be saying, anti, uh, yeah, we will go through tribulation before the rapture. You will. Except if the Bible doesn't say so. So children of God, I don't know what level you are, but tonight, I want us to pray as you understand. Let me end up with this. Hello? Can you see this?
what is this one? What is this? Eh? Can you all see it? Can you see it? All right. It's a very, very, uh, I don't know how to say it. It's far from the best. Just manage it. It's the best I could do as a human being. But I want to illustrate to you this with this. Now, all this instrument that we have here, the air conditioning and all this public address system and everything, why are they working? They are working because they have power, right? It doesn't matter how fantastically engineered they are, without power, they are useless. That's the first thing you have to understand. Your life is useless until it's powered by God himself. I don't care how much. I mean, there are people who have first class, and they have a master's degree, and they have pious or certificate, but their life is useless because it's not powered by the right power. And so, until your, be- your, your gift, your talent, your everything, which is given from perfect and all that, until it is plugged into God. See this, this little thing there. Let that represent Jesus. Are you listening to me? That is what links you with the source of power, which is unlimited. The source of power is what? It can carry anything. But it starts from this being plugged to it. When it is plugged to it, it now has the power to now let others get from it. That is John 7, 37 to 39. You now become through what the country through which others can now begin to tap and receive and tap and receive. You understand what I mean? Amen? And how big and useful you are going to be will depend on the size of your cable. That's why the word of God says the just shall live according to his faith. This is faith. And this faith is what covers the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says that works by faith. The Holy Spirit in you, nobody sees it. But what they see is the demonstration of your faith. The bigger your faith, the more you will accomplish. The Holy Spirit is available to you. Let me warn you, however. I'm sure you know. An unsteady connection of power is worse than no connection at all. Rather than being productive, it becomes destructive. So, if you plug this and it's shaking, and it's... Your equipment is in danger. A life that visits God, and it's not the... Psalm 91 kind of life. The Bible says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide. You shall live there. It shall be your permanent address. But when you go away, then they see you in another two weeks, in another three months. You have a shaky connection. A little today and tomorrow, God is missing you. It's not safe, oh. Because nature abhors vacuum. The moment you have a little, a little vacation from God, the devil is always there to fill that guy with seven demons. Amen. Children of God.
There are other dangers that are out there. Oh. The LGBTQ plus. LGBTQ plus means lesbians, gay, bisexual, trans transgender, and like that, like that. These are the people, and that is being promoted all over the world now. Hello? Do you know that November 23, last year, this November 23, last year, Nigeria signed what is called the Samoa Agreement. Samoa is just one of the islands. It's a small island where the nations of the world which are in the West I mean, I'd rather, who are not in the West, sign an agreement in which they said, we are going to agree for gay marriage and legalize abortion and teen pregnancy and all kind of terrible things. The nations of the world who refused to do it, there were about 35 before. And then suddenly, Nigerian representatives have signed it. Yes. And uh, it was... Uh, a serious matter, transgender, transgenderism. You see, it may sound unusual to you, but it's just the way of life now in the West. Transgender is when you are born as a male and you decide to become a woman. Oh, yeah. It's a very terrible process very expensive, but the government pays for it. In America, the government pays for you to do it. It will also legalize abortion, teen sexual abuse, and perversity in African countries. Amen. Amen. There are more terrible things that are out there, children of God. In America, in every public school, in every public school, the LGBT flag flies alongside the American flag. And they have people they call liaison officers in every school that represent it. They are excessively rich, financially speaking. So, and they are the ones <laughs> that on whose back the Antichrist will ride into power. Sorry that I started what I can't finish. But you can go to www.stopworldcontrol.com. You can go to www.aclj.org.com. I'm going to leave a copy of this thing with my father in the Lord. We are in trouble. 
But it's a trouble God has prepared us for. And which we will overcome if uh, uh, not, don't say amen. Let me finish. If you are ready to pay the price, it's not a matter of amen. No, it's not a matter of amen. You see, let's talk about the church now. Because the worst people you can find go with that labor. Because we have lost the real thing, we are now looking for the fake. We are looking for the fake. Why? Everybody wants to be big. Everybody wants to be popular. Everybody is competing to be the biggest church. The biggest auditorium. And we are filling them with beggars who know nothing about the God that they say they are going to meet. The Holy Spirit is there, but it comes with a price. The Bible says, if anyone tests, let him come to me and drink. And the Bible says, it's talking of the Holy Spirit. Ask yourself as you are seated here tonight, what is your test? What are you thirsty for? When you are thirsty for something, you will get it. You will pay for it. You are ready to go any distance because there is nothing to substitute for quenching your thirst. And this is why people are ready to give any seed. People are ready to pay any, any money. Ask them to jump up, they will jump. Ask them to sit down, they will sit down. For what? Because they want to get from God. We have had the prosperity, prosperity doctrine introduced to us. It came in the 70s. God raised Kumui, our father in the Lord, to do his best. He did his best. But may God encourage him. Because everything he did then, we are now seeing. All his efforts, he's doing everything. People in his category, people in his, they did all they can. But unfortunately, we have been introduced into believing that God is a God you can buy. Just pay him. It's all a matter of money. Even when you bring your seed, when you bring your offering, what do we ask? What do we tell you? We ask you to raise it to God. Abi? And you pray and you say, seed, go back to God, go and get more. And because you can never outgive God, whatever you give him, he will give back to you. So it is not wrong to sow. No. The problem is that you have now, we have now made sowing our very goal. Sowing as the end of it. Not as a miss. No. But at the very end, we are in the church to get money from God. And we will pay the price for it. Spirituality who has time. Thank God for convention. I've never been here during the week. But I don't think, sir, is this how people come for Bible study? Oh. What do you want to come and do in Bible study? When they tell you that you have to live pure and you live holy and the word of God says, they shall love your enemy. Who wants to listen to that? All our effort, all our crusade is about getting, 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 getting. And the devil knows it. So he says, okay, is that what you want? I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. 
And because we can't pay the price of waiting, it, it, it costs time. Listen to me. If you look at those ministries that I told you, the last one, the ministry of empowering is so costly. Jesus Christ himself, after teaching his own disciples by himself for over three years, says, there is little I can tell you. There is this Holy Spirit who is coming. Who will do far more than I can do. But you have to wait. After three and a half years, they have to wait. Because he was in the process of making them. It's never easy to make. We are so concerned about the, res the end result. The end result. Hello? What, what is the difference between the medical doctor that is trained in UCH and the medical doctor who bought his certificate on the internet? Hello? They both have documents to say, I'm doctor. Abby? Uh -huh. So what is the difference? The difference is that one went through the process. The process is what makes you what God wants you to be, not the result. No. You can forge the result. All this breakthrough, breakthrough. God will test your breaking and how you come through. You see, this is your idea. Don't, don't, don't stop. Let's stop deceiving ourselves. When you are with God, he tests you. He, he said, Peter, come follow me. I will make you. That making took years. It included failure. It included embarrassment. It included ostracism. It included so many. And you are our leaders. It's time for you to tell these young coming generations. You don't become apostle overnight. You look at you and say, ah, ah, man of Isaka, wonderful. God bless you. How did you make it? Huh? We can see thousands are coming to you or something. Is that how it started? Didn't you pay a price? Didn't Jesus pay a price? No, but everybody wants the result. When next you are sick, get a doctor who got his uh, doctorate by by the internet. Let him give you injection if you will survive. <laughs> and we expect God. Listen, you are having break, just, just run through. By the grace of God, I have two Bible colleges. And I know people prefer that Bible colleges to my own. You know why? All it takes for them is three months of one day every weekend, and they have a diploma in theology. Abby, who wants to sit down under this man that will tell you, you cannot, don't do this, don't do this. These are, there was one man who led my organization before, and he told them, he said, he said in Yoruba, only man shumato ban quality for Jolon to young labe. And he ended up in a ministry where he, what did he know? He was not even a Sunday school teacher with us. Before he knew why he had become deacon. Before he was become pastor. Five years later, he was dead. I'm sorry about it. It saddens me because he was such a great man. But nobody wants to go through any training and we want to be useful to God. How can you? When, when this ministry, these are our fathers in the Lord who live long, who succeeded, who, on who we are still building today. Fifteen years after you have been in the ministry, you are yet to become a pastor. Fifteen years. Huh? Even children in high, even in the polytechnic and universities, they call themselves Papa now. Papa. On campus. Let's stand up. Listen to me. When 
you lack the original, you decorate the fake. If you have to be pushing people's head for them to fall, you lack the power to make them fall. When you have to be arranging miracles, then it's gone. What's the point? Why? Because people need the miracles, the signs, the noise the, to come. Is that what you are called to do? No. Number one level, conviction. Paul was suffering. He was in chains. And he spoke to Timothy, 2 Timothy. He said, my son, don't be ashamed of my chain. He said, I know whom I believe. The first prayer I want you to say today is, Lord, give me conviction of why I am called to be a Christian. You mean, is this all about my life? Okay, I need more house. You build more house. Is that all? Is that what life is all about? House? Car? Those who had it before you, where are they? Give me a conviction. Help me to know. Jesus, give me the grace to be convinced by you and give my life to you tonight. You need the infilling, which is the fourth level. Lord, fill me. You see, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, your purpose for living becomes real. You will know there is much more to life than all this getting and getting. And if you are already filled, please go for the power. Go for it. Listen, let me tell you, God is not looking for a multitude, but he wants the remnant to be powerful. Those who are going to represent him in these last days are going to be strong and do great exploits. Great exploit does not depend on the number. Hello? By the grace of God upon our lives who are here, each of these great men of God, they are the one God has lifted and they, and they draw so many. Amen. Imagine, sir, if half of this population will be strong and do exploits. Imagine if in our life indeed we are truly light. Is it possible that when anybody comes to your workplace and they cannot remember your name, if they say, I'm here looking for that Christian sister, will they think of you? Are you better in your way of life? Are you different from them? Don't you make money the way they make money? Where, how, where are you be the, how can you be the light? How can you be the salt when you are no better than them? You need the Holy Spirit tonight. He is the one that makes all the difference. And when you have been called, listen, the only reason people like Peter, people like Paul were able to make it was because they have chosen to be in the minority. They have chosen to be in the remnant. They have chosen to be, whether anybody likes me or anybody doesn't like me. I understand that these days when, they, when you invite people to come and minister, they want to know how many people you have in your church. <laughs> I don't understand that. Because they believe that there is a level of people they can move with. Very stupid and arrogant. Children of God, please. It depends on what level you are. My children in the Lord, you need his power. Otherwise, you will be mere entertainers. God didn't call you to entertain. He called you to minister. He called you to speak to needs. He called you to be filled. 
Because through you, there are those who can, who will not be reached by the message, but will be reached by the music. Lord, empower me. Lord, fill me. It depends on where you are. But you need to talk to God. Lord, help me to allow you to take me through the process of making me what you call me to be. Please pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray as you understand this message, short as it is. Please pray as you are led. Pray. 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 Whatever God has committed into your hands, we need more power in these last days. You need more power in these last days. The power to resist the temptation to become like them. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Jesus, help me, Lord. Empower me for what you called me for. Empower me for what you called me for. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. It's going to be rough. Lord, strengthen me. Lord, strengthen me for the days ahead. For the days ahead. Please strengthen me. Strengthen me. Lord, please strengthen me. When I have to be alone, when I have to be rejected, Lord, strengthen me. When my message becomes unpopular, when nobody sees with me anymore, Lord, please strengthen me. Strengthen me, Daddy. In Jesus' name we pray. I choose to be a man of exploits. I choose to be a woman of exploits. Father, make me strong for you. Raise your voice to the Lord and pray. I have chosen to be a man of exploits for you. Those who know their God shall be strong and shall do great exploits. Lord, I have chosen to be a man of great exploits. Make me strong. Help me to know you. Help me to be intimately connected with you. In the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. It is my decision. I will do great exploit. Therefore, Lord, help me to know you. Make me strong. Make me strong. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Make me strong, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hear our prayer, Lord, for we pray in Jesus' name. Open your eyes and look at me. Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses. That's what says what in that Acts 1, 8. You shall receive power and then you'll be my witnesses. Starting from Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, I mean Judea, Samaria, to the end of the world. Who is a witness? Let's define it. Who is a witness? Huh? Somebody who has experienced something and is ready to share it. That's all. You saw what happened. You want to share it. That makes you a witness. 
The last prayer I want you want to say, and which I'm going to agree with you is, God, make me a witness of who you are. Listen to me. I want you to give God something tonight which only God can do. And then you will be empowered to be a witness to him. He doesn't want false witnesses. No. He doesn't want you to go and tell the world God is good when he's not been good to you. Yes. You know, we all say it. God is good all the time. But something tells us and says it's not true. Whether God is good to you or God is not good to you, God is always good. But you need to feel and enjoy his goodness for you to have the boldness to say God is good. I remember when I was in so social situation, God was good to me. When I was sick, he healed me. Why do you think God takes you through problems? It's so that you'll be able to represent him when somebody else is in that problem. Lord, give me a, make me a witness to you. And then you tell him in what area of your life you want him to make you a witness. This thing that is going on in my life, this challenge I'm facing, Lord, add this to my witnesses. Add this to my experience. Let me be a witness to you. Give me the privilege to be your witness in this area. Come on, pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Talk to God. It's a matter between you and God. Talk to him. Oh, Jesus, thank you. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Make me a witness. I've heard you, I've heard people say, you do so and so. I need it now. I need a miracle now. I need your intervention in this situation. You have done so many in my life. But I need this one again, Lord. I need you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you all the glory, O oh God. Hear our prayer, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Will you please raise your right hand up as a sign of agreement with me? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. We are here gathered before you. God, who loves us. God, who cares for us? Your word says in Romans 8, 32, you said, if God can give us his only son, what else is it that he cannot add to it? I'm asking tonight, oh God, your children have been told that we need to go and look at some areas of our lives and we will be qualified to really, truly represent you. But Lord, we need a witness and the world needs witnesses. You are sending us out to be witnesses to you. Please give us a reason to be your true witness in the name of Jesus Christ. I agree with my brothers and sisters tonight that that area of your life, which only God can do, that challenge which only God can find a solution to, that area of your life where except God will come up, you will end up in shame. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that the mighty hand of God shall go into that area and do the necessary now in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, receive your miracle. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whatever it may be, receive your miracle. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, receive your miracle. Be a witness to the Lord. Through you, the world will see who God is. And his name shall be glorified. Thank you, Father, for doing it for us. We give you all the glory, O oh God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Put that hand on your head. Put it on your head. Don't clap. That hand that you stretch to the Lord is coming straight from God. Put it on your head. And when you raise it, I want you to use it to begin to worship God. Let God do what he wants to do with the hand that has just gone before him. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please raise your hand and begin to worship God with it.
begin to say, Lord, thank you.